Hey everyone, this week's discussions and videos on community activists and leaders are about people who have sacrificed so much of their lives in the struggle for peace and social justice. The readings deal with key concepts needed in community practice. They also have so much to do with how we can incorporate an awareness and understanding of justice into direct clinical practice. I suspect that these are a review for you, but they're an important one to emphasize, especially as we seek to work to protect our clients and communities' rights and dignity in a world that is regularly and systematically working against them. Discrimination. The readings emphasize a definition that goes beyond the textbook definition of distinguishing between things to refer to distinguishing between social groups based on characteristics and treating them differently as a result. Some examples of that that we see are discriminatory lending practices, housing practices, um, the historical practice of redlining or excluding people based on race or socioeconomic status. Um, we also see common ex common examples of school segregation, racial profiling, social work interventions or social interventions that we can see that work against um, discriminatory practices are about laws, policies that protect people, um, policies that promote fairness in practices like lending, renting, sales, access to public spaces, as well as awareness campaigns to promote equality um, or just an awareness of the humanization of the other that um, sometimes is defined as different. So that leads us to racism, um, which is discrimination based on race or ethnicity and that which is supported by power, institutions, and laws. Um, it's important to emphasize that because racism is the exercise of discriminatory power um, by people who have power over the group which is being discriminated against. We also deal in social work with the effects of discrimination based on class, sexuality, other areas that become isms, that become um, institutionalized practices of discrimination based on those factors. Oppression is discrimination carried to its extreme. This is discrimination where people are subjected to physical and psychological brutality, um, which can lead to genocide, incarceration, um, other forms of brutality. Oftentimes when people try to rise up to change their situation, they're met with force, intimidation, and hatred. Some modern examples of oppression that we have seen in history, in recent history, and also in present day time, are civil wars that happen in Guatemala and El Salvador and many other countries, um, where the use of paramilitary death squads um, to murder dissidents was um, used to try to intimidate people from um, rising up against um, dictatorships and other oppressive governments. We also see the effects of the systematization of school to prison pipeline where relationships between lobbying firms for private prison companies impact um, governmental investment in many social groups. We've also seen the history of repression of civil rights in the American South and many other places by using beatings, incarceration, murder to keep people from rising up to um, demand their civil rights. We've seen examples of genocide in Rwanda, um, civil war in Syria. We've seen many, many current examples of um, groups using rape as systematic warfare to intimidate against rebellion. Um, these are hard situations to deal with, and in social work, um, our job is often about facilitating liberation, whether that's physical, spiritual, mental, um, trying to work with people during times of political upheaval, um, understanding and sometimes supporting the idea of revolution in different types of ways, whether that's micro or macro. Um, other economic sanctions that can be used as an intervention to place pressure on governments, um, and also helping people develop awareness. Um, oftentimes, a key component of oppression is secrecy. Looking at um, international pressure as a tool, such as Amnesty International or other international campaigns to help people um, work against situations of oppression. That leads us to understanding internalized oppression. Either in this is something that either um, operates on an individual basis where a person turns the discriminatory messages that they receive 
inward, or sometimes where members of a particular oppressed group turn that oppression on one another within the same social group and other vulnerable marginalized groups. These situations can be very difficult to work with, um, but are important to deal with um, both in the way that we work as social workers with people from marginalized populations or oppressed groups, um, but also how we work um, on developing social policy and understanding how that social policy either helps or hinders um, people from oppressed populations um, to find their own source of personal liberation from internalized oppression as well as the idea of political liberation from external oppression. Privilege is um, the concept of unearned benefits given to people who fit into a specific social group strictly based on certain aspects of their identity. There are some great short videos that you can find on the internet that unpack the idea of working with and recognizing privilege. This is a concept that is being talked about a lot currently and it's really important for us to understand as social workers that we bring with us many times um, certain benefits based on simply belonging to whatever social group people belong to. Um, and there are many different levels of this. And wherever we come into, um, wherever we come in based on who we are, um, it's important to understand what privileges we are bringing in order to understand um, how those may be impacting the way that we're interacting with clients and families um, in our social work practice and also in our lives. Um, some examples of this obviously are white privilege, male privilege, heteronormative privilege, the idea that simply belonging to particular social groups um, places you on a different place that um, is not necessarily good or bad. It is just simply the way that society um, benefits certain pieces of identity. Um, it's important as an intervention, it's important to become aware of your own privilege, whatever that might be. Um, and working to resist taking advantage of that privilege whenever possible. It's also important to resist utilizing privilege to demonstrate undue power and influence. So that leads us to cultural competence. Um, the readings do a really good job of identifying certain characteristics of what makes up cultural competence. And it starts with cultural knowledge, so um, identifying cultural characteristics, history, values, beliefs, behaviors of ethnic and cultural groups, um, taking that to the next stage of awareness. Um, how do you understand those groups? How do you become open to the idea that cultural attitudes can change, that our perspectives are based on cultural experiences and exposure? Um, that also then leads to cultural sensitivity. So taking your awareness of particular cultures um, and understanding that differences exist between them um, and understanding and being able to communicate about um, differences that um, exist between those cultures and helping people work through that. Um, especially if there are um, conflicts um, or practices that might conflict with um, a particular cultural group's practices, um, a particular employee or coworker's belief system that is um, possibly in conflict with um, a work situation. Um, you know, the possibilities are endless of ways that culture can influence um, and affect our practice. Um, so becoming culturally sensitive is understanding and managing conflicts um, and also practices around um, culture. Cultural competence, um, especially in the organizational setting, brings together all of those skills that um, you learn in dealing with people from different cultures, um, the knowledge, the awareness, the sensitivity to culture, um, and bringing those together into policies, attitudes, um, practices, behaviors um, that help people learn how to work effectively in cross-cultural settings and produce better outcomes. 
How do we utilize other languages, ensure access to interpretation services, understand cultural preferences and traditions um, of groups that you're working with, adapt interventions um, to be appropriate to cultural traditions, um, beca becoming aware of ethnocentrism in your practice or agency's policies, changing those policies when necessary, um, and also recognizing when other skills are needed that are not your own skills that would more appropriately address a particular need based on culture. Um, these are all skills that can be utilized in developing cultural competence within your social work practice and also um, social agencies. So understanding and practicing based on um, all of these concepts help social workers develop the kind of leadership exemplified by the community activists in this week's videos. And I really like the, the reading from the toolkit on becoming a servant leader, learning how to truly listen, and listen to others, involving others in our practice, promoting teamwork rather than individual decision making, enhancing problem solving skills, um, believing that we are the first among equals, um, working to build a team, working to be aware of power and using it honestly, um, working to recognize that the day-to-day -day details um, involved in social work and social movement are as important as the movement itself, um, caring for the people that are represented by the leader, starting where they are, helping people achieve what they want to achieve, inspiring other people and being adaptable. Um, I once heard um, said that um, a movement is only as strong as the leader that helps it survive without that leadership. Um, I think that that's a really good example of what it is to become a servant leader. Um, then bringing it all into practice. So these macro concepts have a direct link to the lived experiences of individuals and families um, whom we work with in clinical settings. We can reduce shame and suffering by understanding these political concepts of discrimination, racism, oppression, um, cultural competence, um, by helping people understand that sometimes people's problems are a direct result of larger social policy failures and that they aren't alone in experiencing them. Um, sometimes as clinicians or people doing direct practice, it's so important to be able to make connections between the um, micro manifestations of um, what people are experiencing um, on a macro level. And sometimes that's appropriate and sometimes it's not to talk about with people. But as um, social workers, it's really important for us to be able to make those connections um, and bring them into the conversation whenever it's appropriate for that client or family. Um, it's very important to consider the idea of including these macro concepts into our direct work um, and also as part of our ethical duty to participate in, um, in decreasing and working against social injustice. 